In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue, and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. Welcome to Design United's 11th Design Conversation, a very special conversation on mentorship. Mentorship and constructive criticism is essential to nourish designers. Design United starts an exciting mentorship series today with design practice, with two inspirational designers and mentors sharing their experiences and their design journey. We will be in conversation with architects Nisha Matthew Ghosh from Bangalore, India, and architect Minvi joining us from Kuching, Malaysia. I'm Varna Shashidar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by Clayworks Spaces in this endeavor. Clayworks creates flexible co work spaces that focus on productivity and sustainability. I'm also supported by a wonderful team in this endeavor. We will be starting our new segment in progress, featuring young practices. Uh, first, started by Harshit Nayak Priyanka Rastogi from Para Architecture and Arjun Ravi from State of Design. This will happen on July 4th. They will be obtaining mentor feedback and constructive criticism on their projects by two renowned architects from the region, architect Shabir Unwala from Design Workshop Lonavala and architect Palinda Kanangara from Palinda Kanangara Architect Sri Lanka. So please continue to join us every week on Saturdays at the same time, 4.30, for the conversation. So with this, we will be starting our very first session of design practice. So with this background, to Design United, let's move to the much anticipated presentation and conversation for this evening. I'm really delighted to welcome our inspiring presenting designers for the evening, architect Nisha Matthew Ghosh and architect Minvi. Their presentation will be followed by a moderated discussion. So please do type in audience questions for the designers, which will be answered in the discussion that follows. I'm really privileged to introduce architect Nisha Matthew Ghosh from Bengaluru, India. She situates herself within the practice of Matthew Ghosh Associates, which she established with her husband, Somitru Ghosh. The practice is renowned for its projects, which includes Freedom Park. What is really distinctive about architect Nisha is that she has managed to create a reflective curatorial practice within that looks at the confluence of landscape, urban readings, architecture, and product design. Welcome to Design United, Nisha. Our second speaker for today is architect Minwi. Architect Minwi from Kuching, Malaysia, is, has 30 years of practice and is the principal of Design Collective, an award-winning architectural practice based in Kuching. The Design Collective comprises of two practices, 
established by Mindy, Arlene Chu, and Leon Glan Wen, three former directors of Design Network Architects. They practice in a studio environment where they discuss and debate, where they teach and listen. They share ideas, manpower, resources to create projects that are relevant to their context, are desirable to inhabitants, and affordable for the end users. And what is really important and very relevant to our mentorship module is that they believe in the pedagogical value of their projects and also in training their young team and very humbly, they say themselves, to develop and test new ideas. We're so delighted to start our design practice session with these two wonderful architects, Nisha and Mindy. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is the first time I'm presenting online, so um, it's a bit strange talking to myself in an empty room, to be frank, um, but I'll, I'll try my best. Um, and it's also the first time that I'm, I'm talking specifically about um, the way we run a practice. Usually we talk about our projects, um, but I'll, I'll try and do the same uh, because I can't, I can't see really anything unique about the way we, we run the practice. Um, so I'll just present and see what the audience thinks. Um, I'll start at the beginning, okay? Talking about efficiency, about early lessons in sufficiency. Um, I grew up with my grandparents and one of the earliest memories that I have was making furniture using recycled timber with him. Um, these lessons are infused in other parts of our daily lives. Um, ones that perhaps we are familiar with, such as uh, not taking two, if one will do, um, making use of what we have instead of buying, and so forth. So, so these lessons we, we take with us. So when we have our own children, we tell them that no need to buy a bed. We can make one ourselves. Two doors recycled from a renovation project um, makes, a, makes a bed. And if we don't know how to make the legs, um, we'll just put wheels on it. Um, of course, when we take these lessons to work and do the same thing with our borrowed children, we have to dream of um, slightly bigger projects uh, because these are university students. Um, so this is a sun room that I built with uh, five university students, um, a project that they drew up and built over three weekends. Um, the lesson here, I guess, is um, both tangible and non-tangible. The tangible lessons, are how, how do you work with timber? Um, if you turn timber on an edge, it becomes a little beam that enables it to span a longer distance. Um, they also learn maybe non-tangible lessons such as um, how to listen, how to uh, build a relationship with the client, who's also the builder in this case. Um, and they, they learn that the reward is the thing that's built um, and the ability to then put this in a portfolio to perhaps share the pride that they, they take in their work. Um, during, during the last 20 years, we've had a number of interns go through our office. Um, usually there are about six per semester. And although they work with us on projects that enables the office to make money, we also dream up assignments that um, enrich their experience while they're training with us. Uh, this is another one. Um, it's a little garden shed that we built in all folks' home um, for them to plant orchids. Um, the, the, the deal with them is that um, they draw, they get to build it, uh, and if they participate, they get to put it in their portfolio. Um, so on, on three Saturdays, they spend building and assembling this steel structure. Um, and again, there are lessons in the tangible part, tangible part of um, the exercise, uh, putting things together. And of course, the other part is to, um, to see the thing that's built. Um, there are quite a number of these projects. I'll, I'll um, perhaps share, they, they eventually they, get, they grow bigger and bigger. Um, this is another one, which is a, a, a real project with a real client. Um, the reason why I show this one is because in this particular case, the contractor, the man in white, he, he, um, he also buys into the idea of um, 
what we are doing, yeah, teaching the young uh, graduates in our office, he uses this project to actually train uh, two of his sons uh, to take over the son family business. Um, so, so the students run all over the place. They, they, they do the details. Uh, they learn about construction sequence. They learn about prototyping. Um, they get to see, uh, importantly, what the, 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 the connection between what's drawn in the studio and what's built on site. Um, they, they start to understand the power of a, of a simple line, like um, the one you see here, you know, just basically tapering the edge of this ledge enables an easier transition to up the stairs. Um, so these are the things that uh, we try to encourage our students to do. It's, a, it's almost like an um, unspoken promise that we have. Every time they come in, if they stay for more than three months, we promise them that they will get to build a project that they can put in their portfolio uh, to show drawings as well as constructing photographs and hopefully the build project as well. Um, and that's a very hard promise to keep. So, so sometimes when actual projects run out, uh, Sam and I, we, we think of new ones, such as this illegal extension that we did in our garden. Um, so it's just to keep that momentum of uh, getting the interns to draw, um, to experiment, to visit the site, to ask questions, uh, to provide solutions. Um, we deliberately use very, very simple materials because we want them to um, take away the notion that um, with something very basic like brick, um, steel, uh, simple louver windows, you can actually uh, create a space that's um, quite unique. Um, so, so we also deliberately used um, two types of uh, supports one in brick piers on one side of the building um, and steel on the other side to contrast the heavy and the light. Um, and also to maybe take the idea of the brick, which is normally a very solid material, to lace it so that it becomes transpa transparent. Um, just, to, just to put different ideas in the students' heads while, while they are with us to, to perhaps stretch the envelope a little bit. Um, so there's always this tendency to try and um, participate in the construction ourselves. Um, so we left part of the kitchen unfinished and uh, together with uh, two of them, uh, we decided to complete the kitchen using windows that were recycled from a renovation project. Um, so it becomes a, a kitchen and we use this space for uh, various things, for uh, serving friends, having dinners. Um, and this pavilion became my office during the lockdown. So we use this office, use this space as my office for, for three months. In fact, I'm, I was speaking uh, to you from here. Um, so I thought that I'll talk about a real project, just in case you think that I spend most of the time, my time just running around, dreaming up illegal projects with um, students. Um, this is a project that we did maybe seven years ago. Um, it's one that won several awards locally. Um, I, I like it because it's, um, it makes use of an existing building. Um, this building is an existing municipal council built in the 1960s, 1964, 63. Um, you can see from the, from the photograph that it's actually a, um, a building that's uh, very open. Uh, it's got a concrete uh, vaulted roof. Um, in the days before, um, offices had air conditioning. Uh, but but since since its construction and in the past twenty years, with air conditioning and with um, the more partitioning uh, partitioning up of the rooms, it's become uh, quite a uh, ordinary space. Uh, so when we were told to take it over and convert it into a, a museum a heritage center, uh, one of the first things that we did was to take out all the extensions that, that, that was put in place between um, the 60s and the 80s and the 90s. So rip everything off and keep the, um, keep the shell only. Um, this, this project is unique in the sense that we, we, we took on the project and we distributed the work amongst all the architects in our office, very similarly to how um, we work with the interns. Um, we split this whole scheme into a series of smaller projects that are completed by um, architects with their studio. 
So we, we saw that this is actually a good way to enrich the scheme and also for everyone to share in the final outcome, very similar to how the interns are able to take away a part of the project um, to include in their portfolio. I thought it'd be nice for the architects and the partners in the office to be able to share in this um, project, which was quite a big project uh, for our very small firm at that time. Um, so we presented this very simple scheme um, to the client to say, look, we're going to keep the existing structure. Uh, we're going to introduce nature back into the, the building. Uh, there used to be trees in the middle of the courtyard, so we're going to put the trees back. We're going to complete the circle so that it becomes a complete uh, 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 round loop to the, at the, on the first floor for the museum. We decided to also add a body of water. Uh, this creates like an urban edge to the, to the streetscape so that it is able to provide another element, which is water, uh, but it also serves as a, a, a device to control the movement of people into the building. And if we were to introduce new elements, uh, they will be uh, very obvious. Uh, they will not try to fit into the quite strong silhouette that the building has already. So they will sort of stand out as themselves, um, such as the funnel that you see in the little model here and other elements of streetscape that I'll talk about later on. Uh, one of the other challenges too is that with a lot of these adaptive reuse projects, restoration projects, um, usually, uh, in my country, in Malaysia, they have a difficulty uh, earning its keep. Um, so we needed to generate income that would earn its keep because the museum uh, provides a free entry. Uh, so the ground floor would be for retail outlets, for shops, for um, cafes and things like that. Um, and then the museum is on the first floor. Um, often when we uh, do drawings and present uh, do finish our presentations we always ask ourselves um, is this is this scheme distilled enough uh, would the second year student understand it um, this is so that it makes it easy uh, it's a project that the end user is able to understand and use intuitively so so when it's completed you can see that uh, we we got to build almost all the things that we wanted to, the funnel, which is the entry, you can see from the photograph. Um, we asked the council to let us annex the, the part next to it uh, so that the building has a forecourt because um, all the other uh, urban ages are uh, busy roads. Uh, so we wanted the, 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 the museum to have a forecourt. Um, so, so then if you look at this, um, photo, this aerial photograph, you can see how we've introduced elements that sort of disrupt um, the fabric of the existing building um, to signal that something new is happening um, and to maybe welcome and suck people into the building itself. Um, so the funnel is one of the elements. Uh, it becomes a little project that was undertaken by one of my partners there. Um, it's, um, it's, it's many things rolled into one. Uh, I guess there's one of the ideas that we have with sufficiency. So uh, the one the one element must serve many purposes so that it sort of earns its keep as well. So it's an, it's an entry statement. Um, it can be used as a stage for performance. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a device for controlling people um, the, at their entry into the building. It's also a bridge that sort of uh, bridges across the local feature. And the materials that we selected are um, also quite humble in nature. These are these are timber that are not plain; they are rough timber. Uh, it's it's a bit cheaper. Um, it also alludes to the jetties that um, you see along the Cebu waterfront. Um, this is how you would use it if you if it was to use it as a stage. And then where it where it connects with the building, we sort of lighten the structure a little bit, put in a skylight, so it becomes a bit brighter. So the connection is a bit softer. And then you can see that you're actually bridging the gap between the outside across the body of water into the building itself. And once it goes inside the building, it becomes another thing. It becomes an exhibition space. Uh, it sort of insinuates itself into the nooks and crannies of the, the building, as you can see from this photograph. Uh, so it, in itself, it's a sculpture, but I guess it's also a space that you could actually quite easily exhibit sculptures and paintings and uh, things like that. So doing many, giving the, the, the feature many, many functions makes it harder for a client to say, 
no to it, we find. Uh, because you see, uh, because it serves so many purposes, it sort of earns its keep and makes it a bit harder to take away from uh, your design scheme. Um, many of the existing uh, features are kept. The van block walls, we just cleaned them up, took out, took out the windows that they put in front of it um, and retained them, and just gave them a new coat of paint and retained it. Um, this is obviously cheaper, but it's not just because of cost that we did that. Um, it's, to, it's to also retain the original character of the building so that the old can have a dialogue with the new, um, so that the original soul of the building isn't lost. Um, so we play a little game with ourselves when we're doing the uh, demolition. We said, look, maybe we can do a we can do a thing where, as much as possible, we reuse whatever, even if it's debris, we would use it. So you can see um, on the hardscape, right? What we did was that we instead of using expensive imported stone to provide the texture and the color, we just used to crush up all the bricks that was part of the demolition and use it as hardscape in the in the central courtyard. Um, and because it's 2011 and it's finished, we needed to provide uh, disabled access. There isn't a lift in this building. In the old days, they, were, they, they, wasn't so, they were not so um, access conscious, so they didn't have a, a ramp. Uh, so this ramp sort of, it's a little bit like a jungle walk, you know, so you walk up there, it's, it's, a, it's a nice gradient, um, and it goes half, a, half around and it brings you up to the space upstairs. So that's one, one little assignment within an overall scheme. Um, and another one is uh, how the exhibits were uh, going to be displayed. So this this uh, young lady here, um, she she likened the circular plan to a board game like Monopoly or Snakes and Ladders, um, and and devised a, a sort of a a maze through which uh, the visitors would visit the exhibits and. Um, so she made this model and we presented the model to the, the client to say, that, look, you know, this is how uh, you would go through the space. We took all the old photographs and all the old exhibits and um, scanned them and posted, uh, pasted them onto these this, this walls that you, you wander through. So the circular floor plan sort of lends itself to that kind of exhibits. Um, if you want to just look at, um, look at it generally, you just walk on the outside where the corridor used to be. Uh, but if you're a bit more interested, you want to duck in and have a look, you can. Um, we make sure that the or original structure is kept and is sort of shown as um, the, the, the backdrop to this exhibition space. Um, and then in keeping with this idea of not taking anything away from the original museum, uh, the photographs that were scanned, we sort of grouped them all together and put them together on a, on a big wall, um, sort of like an art installation. Um, so that, that, that became another exhibit as well. So that's another assignment um, that we, we, we created out of this uh, overall scheme. Then another one is, um, you, you keep, we, we, keep, we, we did these posters um, as a bit of a laugh, you know, it's a little bit like um, when you visit IKEA, sometimes they've got these posters uh, of the designers proudly exhibiting um, a piece of furniture that they've designed. So, so we thought we'll do that with um, um, the people who took who took part uh, um, in this uh, the design of the elements. And this is how he. Um, I think he's listening. And I told him to wave when he sees this this slide. Um, he, I think he was in fourth year then, uh, um, uh, doing his internship in Kuching. Um, so we we gave him the 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 uh, part to design to. To devise something to put there. You see, the park is actually quite typical. You know, it's got trees, it's got benches. Uh, we we felt we felt it was a little bit flat, so uh, we wanted to create a bit of terrain. Um, so, which is what he did. Um, he created this uh, um, uh, his response to this flat, featureless forecourt for the museum to create a terrain uh, with canopies and totems. So it's a bit like a like an urban forest with with shade and seating. And also a demarcation between the forecourt and the shops that you see behind um, behind the terrain itself. And and he, I mean, he because he he sort of communicated well in several languages. We thought, okay, you go and talk to the contractors and see whether you can make them understand you. And we just sort of stood back and watched from a distance. Um, 
and he did well because he got built exactly how he drew it. So um, I sort of liken this to um, you know uh, bringing up children, you know, teaching them teaching them how to ride a bicycle. You sort of you know that at some point you you need to let go for them to for them to to truly learn. So this is what we this is what we did. Um, so we started we started I think in two twenty twenty two zero zero nine and we finished in two years later. Um, I like this project not not because uh, it's adaptive reuse, which is something that I'm fond of. I liked it because we we seem to work on it uh, like a university project. You know, it's like a group project. Someone took on one part of it, someone took on another part, and then they all came together. I sort of managed it, um, and then it sort of uh, came together quite nicely at the end. And everyone can claim a part of it, which is the really really most important thing for a, uh, an office that wants to promote design and inclusivity and things like that okay so i'm going to talk about this uh, the last real project that i'm going to talk, talk about the last two projects that i'm going to talk about are community projects quite recent ones um, um i guess what i'm trying to demonstrate here is um how do we use our profession um to contribute towards uh the community uh, so the first project is a a toilet for a rural kindergarten. Um, there was a, there was a phone call one morning saying that um, someone wanted to build a uh, toilet for this this uh, kindergarten because um, it's in a squatter area as you can see, um, and they they don't have proper sanitation. Um, so, you know, as what typical architects do, you come up with a design uh, and you show it to. Um, potential sponsors and donors to raise money, to raise um, funds for uh, material and to ask for volunteers. Um, we wanted to do it in steel because the site condition was quite bad. Um, and we wanted it to be to be light so that the foundations would be light. And we also wanted it to be quick because um, one thing that I learned from years of working with uh, young volunteers is that they are a very uh, valuable resource and you, you don't really want to stretch them. You, you don't want to take up the whole, their whole weekend because if you do, they'll never uh, come back and join you for another one. So what, one of the easiest ways to get volunteers to work with you, like in this case, to dig a hole for the septic tank is to actually get down there and, 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 um, and dig it with them. Um, so, so the architects, the architecture students, the architectural graduates, they, they, they are, the roles are reversed. Um, they, they don't draw, they're not there to be a consultant, to be consulted at this, at this job site. They are there to be laborers. Uh, they're there to build. Um, and I think it's good because uh, it sort of teaches these young people a sense of empathy uh, so that they understand what goes into the building of a, even a very simple structure in this case. Um, I, I like working on these projects because I find that it brings out the best in people, you know, um, the, the naturally um, good people that you, you meet, like this young lady here. She didn't need to be asked. She just came and she, she helped. Uh, she's one of the end users. She uses the kindergarten. Uh, we didn't ask her to help. She just volunteered to help herself. Um, so, so one little structure, um, two toilets in there, a male and a female toilet, three Saturdays, 20 volunteers, and... Um, to date, we've not received a single complaint. Um, so, so that's one of the little things that we did recently, last year. Um, we've also taken our volunteer services uh, overseas, uh, across the border to Kalimantan, which is our neighbor here in, in Indonesia. Uh, we met some people who wanted uh, some drawings done. That's all they wanted, not no design, I think just some drawings done because they wanted to submit it to the local council. This long uh, classroom that you see here, uh, the foundation is rotting away, it's in timber, so they needed to prop it up. They wanted to build another one behind it so that they can decant the students over to the new block while they repair this one. So we said, okay, uh, <coughs> sounds like an adventure. So we, we did the, the drawings. It's quite straightforward, as you can see. The old building on this side, the new ones that we're going to design and build for them sort of replicates more or less the same thing. And then eventually when the, the new school is finished, the old one gets opened up a little bit. It becomes again like the forecourt, the outdoor activity area for the entire um, entire uh, school. These are primary school kids. Um, if you get a chance, right, you should actually visit this, uh, this organization. They're called, it's called Mount Hope. Uh, they are based in Indonesia. Um, they were originally founded 
in New Zealand, I think. Um, they are a, a Christian organization and they, this is, a, this is a boarding school. It's a private school, um, but they provide uh, uh, boarding and they've got about 500 students of um, primary school age up to high school. Um, so of course, uh, as usual, you know, we, we don't want to lose out on the construction. So we volunteered to, to build. Um, so again, you know, like these guys, they can draw a pad footing that is six, six feet by six feet, but to dig one is a totally different story. As you can see, you know, they're, they're basically digging a, a pad footing underneath the existing structure. So eventually this uh, timber column will be removed and then you replace it with a concrete one that you can see them casting. And then the floorboards of the old um, classroom becomes the formwork that they will cast a concrete slab over. Um, in order to work, to, to travel here, you travel for about two hours by car, then you stay the weekend, you, 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 um, you live there, you work there, and you eat with them. Uh, I think this is a very uh, good education process for, for, for the young people because they get to, they get to um, meet the end users. Um, they get to see how, the you know, they get to see the results of their action, to see how um, they can touch people's lives with just very, very um, um, simple thing like drawing up a floor plan. Um, so the, this, this is our last slide. Um, these, are, these are the interns that have, some of the interns that have gone through our practice since we started Design Network Architects um, in, 20, uh, in, in the year 2000. Um, at the last count, um, I think we've got about 200 plus um, interns that have gone through our office. Um, they, some of them are, are, are like our borrowed children. Um, so we've seen them grow um, and uh, they still come. Um, so perhaps the, the, the thing that is unique in our office is that we, we, um, We take this idea of teaching uh, into our real projects, um, so that so that we, we continue to learn from them and and, um, and um, see whether our projects can can teach uh, the end users about a good design that is not for special occasions but is for every day. Okay, that's that's the end of my sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Architect Mindy, for sharing your inspiring work and method of working that is beautifully built on a democratic, generous way of making architecture. Also, a very strong pedagogical value of your projects that I'm sure um, designers will find very, very inspiring. Thank you very, very much. With this, I would like to invite uh, Architect Nisha Matthew to share her work which is a confluence of her many interests in spirituality, textiles, landscape, product design, apart from a very strong architectural practice. She's also been recently selected to design and curate the India Pavilion at the London Design Biennale 2020. Thank you, Nisha. We welcome you. Thank you, Thank you Varna. Thank you, Design United. Uh, Min, I loved, I, I wish I were an intern at your office. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share three stories. Uh, about my life and uh, I'm not going to run through the uh, a detailed uh, delineation of each project, but I will share uh, some ideas. Uh, and I'm going to talk about my work in the built, my work in experimental textiles and my interest in God and uh, you know the relationship between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. So here we are. And um, I think that as uh, Varna described, I have a lot of interests and they're they're very intense interests in other creative domains. So I see myself with no choice but to, uh, to sort of take um, a, a curatorial position. And by that, what I mean is that um, one tends to, to uh, curate a worldview, curate a position, and everything else becomes a means to express that position. So whether it's uh, the confluence of architecture, ecology, uh, or landscape, or ideas on, uh, you know, urban design or cities, or other integrated and yet, uh, you know, allied dis design disciplines. So, yes, I'm going to start with this project. 
uh, which we called the House of Fragments. Uh, before I begin, I want to actually acknowledge uh, my design collaborator. All the projects I'm showing are uh, were done in collaboration with uh, Shomitra Ghosh, an incredible architect and craftsman. I want to also acknowledge the teams who have uh, been with us in the office, drawing these ideas up, developing them, making models, working on site, etc. And I also want to acknowledge the wonderful teachers who gave us the foundation that caused us to uh, be inspired towards making a building. So this is the Benjamin House, and uh, we called it the House of Fragments. And I think the exploration here was to uh, look at the idea, to, to explore the idea of edges when you fragment a building typology. So I hope you can see my cursor and uh, you, you kind of look at, so we were looking actually at um, the house form as we understood it in Bangalore um, and the very predominant uh, you know, house form from which later house form have derived patterns was the colonial bungalow. And we were really looking at the whole um, uh, fragmentation of parts of this and the realignment of this in response to what we felt was a con contemporary condition for privacy and for a new relationship with a garden. So you see that, I'm going to just show that to you, if you can see this. So you see that this entire area is actually what we call the otla or the veranda which fronts a side garden, no longer in front. And the front sort of breaks down into very, uh, very simple retreating planes, which don't really open up onto the street. And um, uh, it, it also, I think that this whole um, uh, sort of exploration and fragmentation was also overlaid with uh, our deep desire to, uh, to really understand and extract, extract really, uh, the maximum from resources such as wind and sunlight, and therefore to position these things in such a way that one were able to, uh, you know, sort of draw in the breeze where it was the best and draw in the light where it was the best. And therefore to uh, minimize energy use. So you see that the house sort of retreats back, it, uh, you know, with, with almost a, a facade that is, uh, you know, it doesn't welcome you in. But uh, you have on the top, if you can see that on the image, you see a little street deck, which kind of opens up a relationship back to the public realm, even while some things retreat, some things still make that connection back. And um, all of everything that is symbolic or um, uh, precious, we kind of integrated that into a, into a wall, which into a perforated wall. This is the space which actually becomes the wind catcher and is positioned to capture the north, north, uh, southwest and uh, northeast breeze. The next project I'm going to showcase is a church that we did some time ago where um, the strategy was really to use light as a material. And um, you find that what is uh, essentially a very simple cuboid form on the outside begins to start to break down in order to use the potential of light to create what um, what ties in to substantiate meaning for the for the user group so this is actually the altar wall and uh, by the time the message is preached you actually have this entire wall with light and also the sort of a uh, very intentional positioning of beams um, so that you have uh, an, a, a, an imagery. Uh, it's used as a memory device to, to bring back something that is meaningful to the users of the church. This is how the section plays out and, and basically um, floats the sanctuary above the street. And the entire uh, lower level sort of opens up onto the street and begins to connect. This is a project that um, was my favorite for very, very many years. It was an built work and it was a competition entry. And um, I think what was significant for us was 
that it established um, in in its um, in in um, sort of um, trying to understand the problem. What we were looking at was a means by which we could establish a method of looking at architectural engagement. And uh, the primary driver for this was uh, ecological intent to uh, revive, to sort of restore, to rejuvenate uh, the ground and the water. And through that process to really derive something that could be a generic structure that could seat an architectural program. So the process of cleaning uh, the, the site and the ground field really became the the fundamental ground on which um, the architectural strategy was even built. And uh, in that process, the, the, the pitted nature of uh, soil that was removed became, um, became an opportunity to be um, what you could call a, a, a mnemonic device to, uh, of scars on the landscape. And uh, perhaps a necessary remembrance uh, because public memory is often short, and um, and something that really and 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 this uh, this texture of uh, the earth uh, became the the anchor to specify program and and develop build program into that. So you see our model. So here you see that there is a deliberate suppression of the architectural object and um, mainly to restore the ecological paradigm. This is um, a project that is being completed still in some sense, the National Military Martyrs Memorial. And uh, you see the site plan, um, it's, it's a part site plan really. But essentially what we had was a pretty densely forested little patch of urban land. And um, the first thing we did was to really find a clearing in this forest within which to, uh, to even make any, ge any gesture on the earth. And um, once we found that, we basically oriented a it was a very simple strategy that we had a path. We just overlaid a path on the forest floor, so to speak. And that path became um, uh, where they would programmatically hold their ceremonial walkways and their wreath laying and um, sort of a very symbolic um, path within the forest. Um, and it, it was, I think, um, an important gesture for us to be able to say that there's a very primary um, need to imprint the earth lightly, given the conditions that we live under, given the, uh, the ravages you know, that are being, uh, that, that we're facing, that our, our generations face in terms of water and uh, you know, land being deforested and um, the crisis that is actually staring us in the face. And um, so it was a very, um, a gesture that was confident and bold that we needed to, to make this statement. So in terms of their programmatic requirement, the clearing became the place for uh, the museum also to slip underground so that the void essentially, the entire um, apparatus of building happens underground and in the clearing. So the forest is left intact. The other aspect about this was that um, the orientation of this is, um, is not east-west, but it is it's slightly angled. To this. It's about 45 degrees to the east-west, which uh, vertical sort of elements, which is the, which is the flag post and the large memorial stone, which is about 75 feet tall, uh, so, so that they don't uh, cause the space, uh, cast a shadow on this 
uh, and basically give you diagonal shadow. So the path is still lit for pretty much most of the evening until the sun sets. This is what the underground structure looks like. A very formal um, um, sort of um, subterranean, submarine-like, barrack-like uh, structure, which actually opens up on the right side into courts which connect to the upper ground. So, so there's a certain amount of light that gives it a sense of a public space still. It's not completely dark. These are some of the step downs into the underground museum. This is, um, I think this is my last project that I'm going to show. Um, this is actually a recent project that we did, reasonably recent. And um, what it basically does, I'm sorry, it doesn't have a plan. It doesn't have a, the, the, I think I'm misputting that in. Um, what it basically does it is that the envelope of this structure maps light and it, in a sense, de denies the borders of the site because it's almost like, um, like an organism which is trying to make apertures wherever it can get light in. So um, this house is actually for a writer. And um, at our very first meeting, in the way that she described um, her whole experience and her love for dark spaces and all of the contrasts of that and all the subtlety of little trickles of light. So I think we were looking at two things. One was that the, the mapping of light would overlap with and the diagonal movement of light um, which we actually did by way of making a model, first intuitively um, assuming and proposing a set of um, apertures and possibilities on a physical model and then a very primitive way, you know, not a computer modeled uh, structure. It was very interesting to, uh, you know, uh, discover what things could happen and what potentials could happen as we did this. Um, so you have a central spine which you're seeing. You see uh, two concrete walls which begin to um, move plane, which begin to turn, which begin to twist, which begin to be also a very stiff and uh, solid uh, core, linear core onto which all the other spaces attach. So you're seeing a part of this here and it starts to move inside and starts onto which, on, and onto the spine, the other uh, larger spaces like the living spaces and the spaces for eating and the spaces to uh, read a book, they attach onto the spine. So it's a very dense uh, space, which is animated only by light. And I think it, it was also the idea of uh, superimposing the narrative of a writer's mind. And uh, you know the idea of uh, of withdrawing, the idea of the subterranean, the idea of creating, even though it's a built form, the idea of creating a subterranean artifice, so to speak. So these are some of the attachments that attach onto the spine. So you've come to the end of the spine, and then you have the attachments there, which which have a distinctly different uh, quality of light, uh, made by large, generous openings. And um, yes, this is uh, this also this little animal you see there is a weaving studio that I started a few years ago um, at the invitation of um, someone to do a show. We and um, and also to you know so that that was really the, the starting point of the weaving studio, and then um, you know the incredible thing was that it became a wonderful place to train people who. Uh, and, and see the marvelous potential that people have. So, uh, you know, the, the person who is my trainer now, who trains other disadvantaged women is actually a disadvantaged, physically disadvantaged man who, was who, who used to beg at street corners. And um, 
you know, I met him. I used to meet him a couple of times and I said, do you want to work? So he said, yes. And he landed up. And today he is meticulous. He has such an eye for detail. He has such an idea for geometry. He knows if something is slightly off, the oval is slightly off. And it's amazing the, the God-given potential in all of us. So this is the Anna Anna studio. And this is the Tiger, our latest weave woven project. Yes. So I'm going to move on to the other section, which is basically uh, textile and, and why we began to do it really, you know, with, with a great frustration at all the stuff that got dumped by the wayside in our city and uh, the frustration at not having a solution. So um, the textile studio began about maybe about eight years ago and we started experimenting then and later became, became something much larger in terms of our agenda to uh, promote um, a way of dealing with fabric waste that could um, that could perhaps uh, give us an opportunity to look at a future way of um, uh, of handling waste as well. So we actually collect scraps of new cloth from everywhere. You know, so we're in the process of. I think you read the word "sustained" on the previous slide. So we're in the process of actually reaching out to factories and um, textile shops and all of these guys who might have stuff that they would typically trash because no one can use it, and collecting every little bit of scrap fabric which is new and clean, and then being able to work a bunch of techniques out to create artwork on fabric and tapestry and curtains and cushions and wherever we have opportunities to uh, create something out of it. So, um, and we work on it like stained glass. This is a project which is part of an exhibition series um, where uh, we actually work this fabric in and then you kind of work on it like a jolly and you, you do some cut work from the back and you layer cloth so that you get colors through colors. It's quite incredible and it's great fun because it's uh, for anyone who loves fabric, it's great. So my interest in this began many years ago when I, I schooled in Ahmedabad studying architecture. I had a, a, a wonderful privilege to meet by chance. I mean, I, I believe it was God ordained, of course, but uh, to meet this lady who was a discovery of Hakusha. And she had this amazing skill to be able to just pick rags and put colors together in such a phenomenal way. You know, it was just something she had was a gift. And I spent hours just watching her do stuff and just buying up a lot of her work because it was just so incredible. So I, I really believe that, of course, I didn't guess at that point in time that I had anything to do with fabric when I graduated and became a full-fledged architect. But I, I'm just so glad for that for those days. This is a piece out of linen scrap. This is a project using multiple fabric. Yes, I've come to the last section, which is basically, um, and, and you know, it, it might seem like it's an odd fit when you talk about design and God, but I felt in the light of what's going on in the world around us, we're living in a changed world. And I felt it was important for me to share my story and, um, uh, you know, just to be able to even make sense of some of these things. And I'll just make it really quick. I won't take more than a minute on this, but um, basically, uh, there are two spiritual kingdoms. This is the whole thing about the seen and the physical realm. And the unseen realm actually does affect the physical realm much more than we know it. So while each of us is wonderfully and beautifully wired and made in God's image, God is not a man, but we're made in God's image. So we're spirit beings, essentially. There is a demonic kingdom. So one is the kingdom of God and the other is a demonic kingdom. There is a kingdom that can come against us. And all of what we're seeing, uh, we're living in a new dispensation of time, right? So what God did on the cross, what Jesus did on the, on, on the cross was to, to work, to make a provision, a heavenly provision, so that we could have access 
and stand against what could potentially come against us, whether it was some grave sickness or some sickness that covers the whole earth or a plague or a pestilence or the lack of protection that we go out and we don't come back. So, so this is what has happened for us. And what it takes is just to be able to appropriate it. So I, I was about 25 years old when um, Jesus got my attention through a series of God orchestrated events. I won't get into that, but it was incredible because it got me interested. And when I got interested, I began to pursue, to understand what, what, what was really going on. And I want to just close by saying that in the light of our present circumstances, every provision for healing, for divine protection and redemption has been made on the cross for us. Sin has been paid for, sicknesses have been paid for. And what it takes is for us to receive it and appropriate it. It's not going to be automatic for anybody in the, in the world. It's not going to be automatic for any, any religious leader. This is the thing above religions, including my own. But what it takes is for us to stand up and take it and say, I command this fear to go out in Jesus' name. I command sickness to go out in Jesus' name. And when we do that, and, and this I speak from personal experience, when we do that, God's extraordinary love for you and for me will back us up. So I want to say that while everything looks bleak, while the whole world is talking about a real lockdown, we have provision made for us on the cross. And if we take it, it is to our benefit. And I just have two last images here showing, which is actually a reminder for me uh, in many areas of healing that I have started to work in and see amazing, the amazing hand of God work for us. And uh, this was just the story of a lady who could not bear children for many years. And she just came to me and I just prayed for her in Jesus' name. And I, I forgot all about her. In between, I used to send a little arrow prayer up saying, God, I prayed for her, make something happen. And a year later, I heard from her sister that she was uh, going to deliver a child. So, you know, this is, this is God's given, uh, you know, his grace given to every single one of us. And, um, I just want to say that all of us are uniquely made in God's image. None of us are going to be like each other, but every one of us has God-given potential to change the world. Thank you very much. My email is right there. I'm very happy to have emails written to me. I can't promise I'll write immediately, but please feel free to reach out. Thank you, uh, Design United. Thank you, Varna. It's been a great privilege to share my work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Architect Nisha, for sharing your beautiful work and uh, interdisciplinary design approach that melds your multiple interests and is also such a personal narrative. Um, thank you once again, architects uh, Nisha and Min. And the mentorship and, uh, and mentorship and feedback is so important to improve critical thinking. We really open our session for conversation. We would like to invite the audience to please share your questions for our presenters. Please type in your questions. I'm also very happy to introduce our moderators for this conversation. Architect Jonathan Edward, who is an architect from Sri Lanka working with uh, Amila Dinell Architects at her studio in Colombo. He studied at the City School of Architecture in Colombo. Uh, he has an interest in landscape and food and is also a co-founder and owner of 3x3 Three Three Granola, a Colombo-based food startup. Our second moderator for today is Sri Vaishali, an architect at 100 Hands Bangalore. She is a graduate from St. Peter's School of Architecture, Chennai. She's also been a recipient of the Roots Foundation Fellowship, where she's had an opportunity to be a part of Kerala Flood mitigation program and effort uh, led by architect Peter Rich with IIA Trivandrum. Welcome, Jonathan and Vaishali. Hello. Uh, hello. Thank you, Varna. Uh, it is uh, exciting to be uh, in this dialogue with architect Min and architect uh, Nisha Matthew Bush. Uh, I should say the presentation was truly inspirational and uh, uh, diverse, you know, um, 
Yeah, um, I would also like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Vaishali, an architect uh, at Hundred and Spang Blue. Here to moderate this conversation with Jonathan. Yeah, and I'm Jonathan, and I'm from Colombo, and I'm so happy and I'm so glad I got to see your work and your story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I would like to start with architect Min. Uh, we became like great fans of your uh, blog. Uh, <laughs> Oh. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get my children to read it. They don't read it. <laughs> um, could we begin uh, with your in impressions of uh, Kuching and your experience in Australia? Oh, ah. okay. Well, that's an interesting place to start. Um, we, 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 I spent eight years in Australia. Uh, starting from high school, the final year of high school and university. Um, and I think, I think it's the education in Australia and the life in Australia and the work in Australia that sort of shaped the way we were, that we, that we think now. Um, when I say we, I include my wife. Um, because when we were there, we were already working. We worked the last two years of our university degree. Um, and through the work, we met many people whom they were very helpful. They, they had no reason to be so helpful to this foreign student working for $15 an hour, but they were, they were so, they were so warm, you know, they, um, um, and they, they went, it felt as though they went out of their way to, to help us, to mentor us. So, so that left a little bit of, um, um, of a, a spark in us. So when I came back to work in Kuching, fortunately, I also worked, I worked in a big firm and you know, in big firms, you could sort of get lost if you are not careful. Uh, I was very fortunate to work under uh, a man, his name is Marcel. He's, he's, uh, he's no longer with us, but he is the kind of mentor that you want. He's, uh, he's very demanding, but he's reasonable. Um, and, and he sort of, um, he practices sort of tough love. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you are, if you're not doing something right, you'll say, this is not good. Don't do it again. But if it's good, right, he'll give credit where credit is due. Um, so that's something that we kept within us. And when we had our own practice, we thought, okay, this is what we want to do. So I guess uh, subconsciously, we've been doing that all the while. That was great. Uh, architect Nisha, could you share your experience um, in Ahmedabad and how um, this great master's like influence your work? And yeah. that's uh, yes, thank you for asking. Um, it was an incredible time at Ahmedabad at the time that we were, I, I was there from the late uh, 1980s to uh, early 1990s. And um, it was just, I think um, that was the time when Kurula Varki came in from uh, and, and took over as directorship. And uh, suddenly there was a new buzz and energy. There was a lot of discussion about what is Indianness and examining Indianness in the light of what is modern architecture. And um, so that was on one hand. And then you had, uh, uh, you know, teachers like Vasavada and Rajay who were very, uh, very solidly, uh, uh, you know, uh, had a fundamental understanding of material and, uh, you know, how to, um, work a material to uh, to its fullest potential in terms of uh, design and understanding it. And then on the other hand, you had um, a Doshi, mm. Chaya, a lot of wonderful, wonderful professors. And honestly, I really want to acknowledge them today, you know, uh, because I think a good teacher is the one who gets your gets gets you going for the rest of your life. And I'm, I'm so grateful to God for every one of them. And I think it just all worked wonderfully together, you know? So, um, yes, thank you for asking. Thank you, Nisha. Yeah. Um, I had a, when we spoke the first time, we spoke about how you guys run your practice and how um, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on in what you do. Um, I'd like to ask this question from both of you, actually. Um, how does collaboration impact your practice? You, uh, both in terms of, um, the space that you work with, cause you, uh, work with sharing resources and things like that. And also in terms of working with 
craftspeople and designers and things like that. Um, architect Min, would you like to go first? Okay, I, I think our collaboration is um, not quite as sophisticated as Nisha's. We, we don't collaborate, we don't have the opportunity to collaborate with so many artists. Uh, we tend to collaborate with our peers, other architects. Um, so as, as you know, our office is actually made up of two practices. Um, they were former partners of mine in the other practice, so we, it's sort of like a natural thing to just work together and share resources. And they've got a very nice office in town and they invited me, so I, 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 I jumped at the chance and joined them. Um, other collaborations tend to be when we are working on uh, maybe a competition. Um, I find that it's easiest to collaborate with um, people that you've not collaborated before when there isn't money or fees at stake. Okay. When there isn't a chance of winning anything, you just go in and you say, we try. That's the easiest. Um, but the beauty of having so many interns is that now they are not the 20-somethings anymore. Now they are 30-somethings and they are practicing architects. So sometimes they do bring in work that we work together with because there's already that energy that we've had before, you see. Um, so that's, that's very rewarding uh, for us. Yeah. Um, so our, uh, we've always worked together, Shumitu and I, and that has been the largest collaboration. Our studio, uh, Jonathan, tends to be still quite design centric in the sense that we're, we're looking at, if you, if you look at it as a, a curatorship of a show, you kind of, you have a thought that's running through the whole thing and you want all the detail and all of the material choices and all of the decisions to tie up with that one thread. So we still tend to be uh, more design centric than I would guess Min's office. Um, increasingly though now, uh, I'm beginning to work with collaborations outside and it's not in the space of, uh, my core strength. It's in other areas like film and, uh, you know, um, and, and it's exciting. So like you said, that's right. It's exciting to open new collaborations because I think it broadens the way you think. Uh, so we, I think in terms of our own studio, the best times have been when we've worked on competitions because there's been no threat of someone saying, I don't like this, but it's been a free, uh, you know, ability for everyone to express their opinions. And I think those have been the best and more, most exciting times for our studio when we've, you know, had everyone say what they thought and, you know, you picked a line from there. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and I think one of the benefits of being in a small studio or in a small practice is that when things change uh, so rapidly, like it's done in the past few months, uh, yes. it, it gets really interesting to see how we adapt to things. How have both your practices adapted to the new normal as you see it? Go on. Yes. Uh, yes. So um, we've actually, we're actually quite happy about this in terms of our working possibility to be able to, because I think what it does is people have to come from otherwise quite far off and travel in the dirt and grime of the pollution of the city. And so I think in all of that, I think there's been a plus that you are more efficient. You can work in clean air without, you know, so you're more efficient in time. It's healthier perhaps. But I think what we miss out on is physical interaction. So I think going forward, we might actually introduce people coming back, you know, once a week where we have group meetings together and uh, the rest of the time we're, we're working from our individual spots. Yes. But I, I mean, I think the disclaimer to this is that I think we have the luxury of space. So I, I think um, perhaps not everyone might agree to that kind of a model if you're sitting right. cooped up in a tiny little room and you don't have uh, you know the bandwidth to even step out that's probably not fair yeah, yeah. architect me it's, it, it's it's about i guess it's about the same we we i found that i actually had more time uh and i i, I enjoyed the the lack of disruption because uh, a lot of the, the construction sites have shut down they were not able to work so there were no phone calls from site um uh, but that also meant that uh, it will start to affect your cash flow. Um, but 
On the plus side, uh, everyone ended up being more efficient working from home rather than in the office, which was very surprising. Yeah. Um, and they were more productive. Uh, they were very disciplined. Uh, work was submitted when it was meant to be submitted. Yeah. Uh, I was very, very surprised. And I found that I actually a lot of um, free time on my hands. Um, <laughs> I actually made my first cardboard model again in the first, <laughs> first time in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years. Um, so it was very rewarding for me. But um, again, after a while, if you're an office that works in collaboration, sort of like a, a studio situation, you do miss the ability to sit in front of someone and debate an issue or discuss an issue. Uh, we've started going back to work, but we're going back to work alternate days. So I'm there some days to meet with some of the architects, I'm there on other days to meet with the other architects. So they still work from home half the week, uh, and I work from home half the week. Hmm. Okay. That's really cool. Um, Vaishali, you want to uh, add on any more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, what uh, would you think is the hardest uh, thing about managing a project? Uh, do you have any tips for us? Um, architect Minu, would you like to go first? Um, people. <laughs> Be because, because people have egos, and egos are the hardest to manage. Actually, the project itself shouldn't be difficult to, to manage. You see, by the time a project goes to tender, right, everything is there on paper. It's only if you are, have, have the ability to, um, so it's people. Um, I, I remember sitting next to a client once and we were in a site meeting and it got a little bit heated up, you know, people stood up. And then they started speaking, not in English, but in their, their normal Chinese dialect. So, you know, it's getting quite serious. So she turns to me and she says, um, What's this all about? I said, well, you know, they're just discussing something. Let them have a bit of time. Then she turns to me again and she says, what's the most difficult thing about managing this project? I said, people. Then she looks at me and said, are you talking to, are you referring to me? I said, no, I'm just referring to people like this. Um, but it's people. I, I, I don't think um, it's anything else. I think it's people. Architect Nisha, would you like to add something? I think it's the lack of professionalism needing us to have to chase everyone so delays in terms of just being professional and responding back on time i think that is a challenge because then uh, if you've missed it then it's gone into another loop again so if everyone were to be more accountable then i think you know then then projects would flow much faster as well and if, and i i think fundamentally then it is that Everyone needs to feel like they're part of the team together and everyone's got a stake in it. So I think that might make a difference. Architect Nisha, uh, uh, thank you. And I have one more question for you. Uh, how do you manage to navigate between your work as an architect, curator, designer? How do you manage it? <laughs> I have to say it's with God's help. You know, I have to say that because I've seen that at work. I've literally had to shut down myself in, you know, textile and jump into something else and do that very often. Uh, so I really depend on just hanging on to Jesus. I depend on him. But I've seen that uh, things just get by. There, there have been days when um, I've had back-to-back -back meetings and God is so good. I just, something gets canceled down the line. Someone doesn't show up. It, it just goes smoothly, you know. But I agree that when you're doing a lot of, especially for women, I think when you do a lot of juggling, and women tend to do this because we have to, there's kids, there's kitchen, there's all of that stuff. Uh, it can be emotionally draining, you know, so one has to watch that and one has to uh, set slots. You have to be disciplined to maybe shut off your phone from so and so time. To so so that, that's important, yes, it's practical tips. Yeah. Um. One more question. Uh, how uh, this is for both of you? Like, how has your practice stayed um, relevant with the in influx of uh, foreign architects into Asia? Like, um, what have you learned in the process, and how their works have influenced you? Like, how did you get adapted to it, or you didn't? Oh, so, I can just um, yeah. Um, I think. Seeing, I think the good part is that we um, we learn from each other, and I think that overrides the whole aspect of competition, because I think 
uh, um, I'm thinking a lot. I'm saying a lot of things, but no, I, I uh, learning from each other needs to become the thing over the sense of competition from a fellow architect, because that competition is not going to go away. And if uh, and I see that there's always going to be enough work. If you don't have enough work, we can always make a project of our own, you know, something we saw what Min had done. And, uh, you know, it could be a social project. It could be something to help the community. So there's always potential to keep yourself busy and to get it funded. So I think that uh, competition should not have to worry us. Because if there is creative impetus, you can use that effectively to make things happen either for your team or for yourself or financially. That would be my take on it, yeah. yeah uh, would you like to add something, Mr. Min? Um, our, our practice is quite small. So the kind of work that we do, um, uh, private private homes, um, things like that, typically there isn't much competition for that, you know. Um, so the big firms, they come in and do a project that are very, very big, uh, which we probably do not have the manpower or the inclination to participate in anyway. Um, but we, we, we don't fear the competition. We don't fear, because you see, our competition comes not only from foreign architects. We are in East Malaysia. So we do get um, firms from West Malaysia who comes in. Uh, they are bigger, they're, they're more experienced, they've got more manpower, they've done more stuff. Um, but I think steel sharpens steel, you know? So it's, uh, there's, there's no need to worry about what they're able to provide that we can. Um, and it's not really affected the way we do our work. Um, we have enough to keep ourselves busy. Although I must stress um, what Nisha said, uh, the work that we invent to keep people busy, uh, they, they don't generate any cash flow at all. So <laughs> it's just basically doing it <laughs> for the fun of it, just to keep busy. Um, it doesn't help with salaries. Um, I have one more question for the both of you, and I think we'll close with that. Um, how do your personal convictions and your spiritual beliefs influence your design and your practice? Nisha? Yes. I, I think for me, it gives me the framework to, to know that the earth and the universe has been created by God and we are accountable and we have to be good stewards. And in being good stewards, we're actually blessing communities that will come after us, whether it's our kids or our, our kids' children or your generation or wherever, you know? So I think it's fundamental because we have to give account to what we've been given charge of. So in that sense, um, I, I think that's how, and of course, yeah, then to treat people with respect and honor because you're not better or bigger than them, you know? God has created everybody equal. So I think, yeah, some of these values do. Uh, architect Ming, any thoughts on that? No, not really. You know, I think, I think, um, I think I'm put here just to work. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and um, it's, it's just one of those things that I, I do. I, I don't dislike it. Uh, there are days when I enjoy it very much. There are days when I don't enjoy it so much. Um, I don't think I'm going to make a whole lot of money in the next, I don't know, five, 10 years. Uh, we've, made, we've made enough money to, to sustain ourselves, to have quite a nice life. And I think I just have to keep working until the day I stop working. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you call that conviction or necessity. <laughs> I think that's what I'm put here to do and, and yeah. I'll keep doing it. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Varna, uh, do you have anything to add? Yes, I would like to thank our wonderful uh, designers, architect Nisha as well as architect Min for such an inspiring um, session, both presentations and more than, more than everything, uh, basically approach to working, method of creating and uh, generosity with which they deal with the people they work with so thank you thank you so much and thank you to our wonderful moderators jonathan as well as vaishali for the session and the audience for being very patient with us thank you and have a wonderful weekend thank you